what a tremendous uh, man he is. And if you don't know him personally, you should get close to him and talk to him. And he's a brilliant writer. He's uh, well-received in his community and building a great church. Would you give him a great big welcome from Connecticut, our district superintendent of Connecticut. God bless you. Brother Cobb. Hello, thank you for being here, Brother Price. Thank you for having this. Uh, when he told me about this roundtable, I was ready to come even before he asked me to speak because I think dialogue is so very important. We don't have very many opportunities to do this, and so thank you for making this possible. Uh, about three or four years ago, Brother Shaw uh, gathered a group of people together for the Forward magazine and asked us to write some articles on the subject of the fivefold ministry because. It's been so widely talked about, and um, I did write some of those. That edition never was uh, written, so I put some of those thoughts into a book, and uh, that last box down there uh, gives you an, an address where you can go to the ACTSII.org. If you go to that website, that's our church website, there's a page called Media, and on that media page, you can download the ebook that I'm going to be talking about here. So if you want to, there's, a, there's about 40 or 50 pages on the fivefold ministry that you can download free if you want to go to that website. Uh, I'm just going to share the guts of that, if you'll allow me to do that. And um, I want to begin by, if we can go to the next slide once they get that down, by talking just a little bit about what happened at conference. If you didn't make conference, you owe it to yourself to go to uh, the media website of UPCI and order the panel discussion that was done on the fivefold ministry. I, I think it was excellent. Uh, there was great men on that panel. And these were eight things that they said that I feel like are very important. And I'm just going to highlight them because of the time constraint. I'm not going to go into great detail. But these are points that great men among us made. One was that the latter rain movement kind of set us back in this area uh, because there was some junk that went on probably because we didn't dialogue and we didn't trust one another. We didn't do what we're doing right here. Secondly, uh, according to those men, they believe that all five giftings that are mentioned in Ephesians 4.11 are still active, and we can discuss that too, but I believe that. Thirdly, uh, that the fivefold ministry is best viewed as function, not titles, not business cards in your pocket, but what are you actually doing. And then they mentioned that one problem with us in the fivefold ministry is that sometimes we self-proclaim. It's not wise to self-proclaim. They also mentioned that a core problem with trying to establish or use the fivefold ministry, recognize the fivefold ministry, is that uh, sometimes it's a matter of control. I'll be a prophet if you be an apostle and, you know, who, who gets to be what kind of thing. They mentioned that submission is the key. I think that was probably the big point. Uh, and then they mentioned that if we will empower one another to be who God has called us to be, if we will allow one another to be gifted like God means for us to be gifted, it will help us to meet our challenge. And lastly, they mentioned that we need to respect one another's giftings. Now, we do this much better when people are thousands of miles away. Like we don't mind Benny de Merchant starting hundreds of churches. Uh, one thing that I appreciate about Brother, uh, Brother Bernard and Brother Kuhn is the culture that they've helped us to change in the movement as they've given people permission to do, for example, multiple congregations or starting multiple works. Because it, in our movement, it used to, I, I was born in Pentecost, I've been in this all my life, and in our movement, we used to think that if a guy had pastored two or three churches, he had an ego problem. But we didn't mind Benny the Merchant having hundreds of churches. We, we cheered him overseas, but we, we didn't trust him in our own state. And I think that's part of the issue. So let me just throw out some things. I'm going to throw it out real quick, and um, obviously you can ask questions. If we would have last night introduced Brother Mooney as Apostle Mooney or Prophet Mooney, there would have been maybe a few people in the audience who, well, I don't know if we go so far. But I, I personally watched Brother Mooney speak prophetically at times. In fact, if you allow me to say this, it's just my judgment, but I believe he's such a great voice among us, uh, calling us, holding us accountable to holiness and things like that, that, that he has a role of a prophet among us. I'm not saying he's Brother Barnes. I'm not saying he sees a lot of visions. I'm saying I recognize that in him. But 
for us to say Prophet Mooney, it's like, you know, it's like, I don't know if we want to go that far. Well, in the, the fourth chapter of the book that I just mentioned, uh, there's, ten, there's about eight pages of scriptures and references talking about the fivefold ministry. And when you get to studying it, you find out, for example, the pastor's mentioned one time in the Bible. And prophet and apostle are mentioned dozens of times. But we'll talk about pastor, but we won't talk about prophet. Why is it that we won't talk about what the Bible says, like we do with salvation, like we do with all our other doctrines? We won't mention what is mentioned most in the Bible, but we'll, we'll do pastor. Well, there's a lot of reasons for that. One, I'll just throw out. Uh, one argument is that when the church went astray in the early centuries, obviously, they moved away from being biblical. So when the Reformation came along, uh, pulling away from the Catholic Church, the Lutherans, or the Reformation movement at least, w didn't want to use a lot of the terms that the Catholics used, and so they started using pastor instead of priest, and, and so pastor became common among us, and we're all comfortable saying Pastor Mooney, but the Bible is more comfortable with apostle than it is with pastor. So uh, why do we have discomfort with that is a, is a question. Could it be that we don't trust one another. So I'd like to zoom out and look at the bigger picture, if we could, for just a minute. Uh, look at God's pattern from the beginning. I contend that God ordains people, and then the earth has to ratify them. And I think we see that again and again in Scripture. I'll mention a few of them. King David was ordained by God, but Samuel had to recognize him, and they had to put him on the throne. And all through Scripture, God would find prophets. Heaven would ordain them. But it only really helped the people when the people embraced them or ratified them. So you have Jesus, the Son of God, God in flesh, coming to his own, anointed by God. He had the giftings, but his own people wouldn't ratify that, and so they wouldn't release him in their own town, so he couldn't do many mighty works in his own town. So we might have prophetic men among us, men who could speak into our lives prophetically, but if we won't recognize that because we're afraid of them, then we, we crimp that off and we cut off two-fifths of the ministry among us if we don't, use, if we don't allow apostles and prophets to be who they're called to be. Uh, Jesus cried, said, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, how often... What he was saying is, heaven has ordained it, but earth has not ratified it. Boy, I'd love to do a great thing, but you won't let me do that among us. So God's always done that. He does that with everyone. He, he would save everybody, but he's not going to make anybody go to heaven. So he offers and he waits for the earth to accept, if I could put it that way. So that divine gifting is very important. If God called you to be a prophet, it's very important that you're called. But it's just as important that your brethren recognize that and give you a place to be that in order for you to actually benefit the body of Christ. So our organization is just that. It's a man-made thing. We're trying our best to structure it to let what God has ordained happen. So what we do is we have a district board. The district board uh, tries to recognize the anointings on people's life. You go before the district board and there's a group of men that say, Okay, we're trying to judge. Are you really anointed? If you're really anointed, then we're going to give you a license and we're going to call you a minister. We're really ratifying what heaven has appointed. So our structure is not a, a, a perfect, but we do need to make sure we're recognizing everything that God has given us. So if, if God has put apostles and prophets among us, if there are men among us who can help us to move the gospel more powerfully, we need to somehow recognize them. But if we don't recognize them, then they feel left out and sometimes try to do what they're called to do outside of our structure, and then we have a mess. It's like somebody without a job description. They just say, well, I'm just going to do this thing. So let, let me challenge us. If we can talk about this, I, I'm not, today I'm not going to tell you how to think about it. Some people believe the fivefold ministry are giftings because Ephesians 4 is about gifts and 1 Corinthians 12 is about gifts. Other people think they're offices because it says firstly and second and third. Well, I don't know. I'm kind of lean in one way, but you could probably talk me the other way. But if we don't talk, I, I don't know where I'm at. I don't know where you're at. We need to talk about that. So while there are some people who would argue that the fivefold ministry 
uh, are not viable. I think most people nowadays, if you look at the discussion at General Conference, believe that we're really supposed to see the fivefold ministry in action. If, the, if tongues did not cease, neither do, did apostles. Um, now, it's clear that in the first century church, all of those things existed, and that there were more prophets and apostles than just the 12 apostles or the Old Testament prophets. I'm not going to go into all of that. But in our culture, we know what a pastor is. We have a job description for an evangelist. We know what teachers are. So they're all among us, and they're doing great, and they're helping us. But we don't know what a prophet is. A prophet is usually someone, someone who's dead. Yeah, he was a prophet. We wouldn't call him a prophet when he was alive, but he's okay to be a prophet dead. He's not going to hurt us dead. So it's like if you have a sheriff in town, but you won't let him wear a badge, what good is he going to do to your town? Well, if you have a sheriff in town, what is his job? What can he do? It becomes a matter of if we don't even define it, we don't know where he fits in then how can he help us? That's why I believe we need to talk about that. Uh, One thing I believe it will do if we'll talk more about this, if we'll try to understand it, even if we're not all on the same page, it will kind of demystify it. Especially when you talk about, say, the role of a prophet. A role of a prophet, we usually think a prophecy, a guy who sees visions and dreams and things like that. Well, that's kind of mystical. You can get away with a lot of stuff over there. You know, Lord told me this. I had a dream. Who's going to argue with your dream, right? It's a little harder to get away with, uh, uh, you know, when you're teaching, you have to point it out in Scripture and things like that. So uh, it's a little, you tend to get loose cannons over there in the apostle prophet realm. And so we get scared of it and we just want to shut it down. It's like the Pentecostal churches, organizations who are afraid of tongues. And so they don't really push it in their organization. And so no one's speaking in tongues in their organization. It just gets shut down. Uh, So if we can empower people by maybe talking about it, then you won't have a guy who sees visions who who tells you what a prophet is. Hey, I'm a prophet, I'm your prophet, and this is what prophets do. Before you know it, he can be doing stuff he shouldn't be doing under the name of I'm a prophet. Well, you haven't told him what it is, so why, why not? As a body, who are these men? Prophets. Apostles, pastors, teachers. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples. We've witnessed, uh, I've witnessed, if you haven't, some God-fearing, good, fasting, praying men clash with our structure, hoping to change it, and many times getting hurt and then going off and doing their own thing. Good men that, that didn't know how to work with their gifting within our organization. I'm not blaming them. I'm not blaming you. I'm just saying if we can talk about that, maybe God can help us with that. Um, Let me throw out one thing. Let's just suppose that these are giftings. God has gifted me to be a, say he gifted me to be a prophet, all right? That means he's given me the gift of insight. He's given me the gift of hearing and speaking direction, not just tongues and interpretation prophet type stuff, but he's given me a gift of giving direction. Well, if I'm a prophet... And I come into a church, and that pastor recognizes that God may use me to give direction, and I am willing to submit to the the pastor and give direction under submission, it can be a beautiful thing. But if, if I'm a prophet, and I really do discern what's wrong with somebody, but the pastor has not given me permission to deal with it, and I go deal with it, now I'm a troublemaker. It doesn't have to do with my gifting. It has to do with how I mess with the pastor. But if the pastor's half scared of me because he doesn't know what a prophet is, then he's not likely to give me permission. And so the whole realm of the prophetic is cut out of our lives because we don't understand it. Maybe we're just a little bit of a scared of it. So if, if it's a gifting, let me just, we're just talking, right? If it's a gifting and not an office, let's just suppose it's not office apostle, office pastor, office teacher, it's like giftings, then it can go like this. If, if I'm gifted as a CPA, I'm good with numbers, all right? That's my gifting. I, I mean, I, I can crack books. I can do just great CPA work. And I come to this conference, and I walk back into his office, 
and I get out the checkbooks and start looking through it. I may be very good. I may be gifted. I may be anointed to be a CPA, but I have no authority to go back in his office and look through his books. So if we can recognize there's giftings, even if you have a gifting, we also need to recognize there's authority. And where does that authority fit into things? So if we can go to the next slide. Uh, I've prepared. Well, you know what? There's a slide that I left out uh, that I'll just describe, all right? I thought I had it in this. It's, it's a picture of a staff from a restaurant. In that staff, there was cooks. There was the bookkeeper. There was the hostess. There was the, the bottle washer. And uh, you can liken it to, and he gave some cooks and some managers and some... If you're going to run a restaurant, you need people in all those positions. But even if I'm the best cook in town, if I'm not listening to the boss, if I'm not working with the table staff, we got a mess. It's, it's all got to work together. So we got to have gifts loan. We got to have all the five-fold ministry, but we got to figure out where that fits in. Well, as a, as a movement, we have to decide together how does it fit in. And sometimes we get afraid because it's like, oh, if we're going to accept the five-fold ministry, we've got to change our whole structure. And now the superintendent's got to be the apostle, and, and now this guy's got to be a prophet. And this guy. But, but I contend that maybe we're already doing it. Maybe we already have a structure of authority. We just don't know how to recognize the giftings. Let me just model that, okay? Here is, um, this is a flow chart of a, like a Dunkin' Donuts or something like that, a, a company, all right, with franchises. It starts at the top with the board of directors, CFO, CEO, okay? Then to the left, the next box down, are the strategic partners underneath the board. There are suppliers, fund management, training. And then if you go to the right, there are people who are consultants, there's quality control people, there's promoters, and there's trainers. And then if you'll, zero, if you'll back out just a little bit, you'll notice that as... You flow down, there are regional offices, and those regional offices then have franchises underneath them. So you've got Dunkin' Donuts up here, you've got a CEO that's running Dunkin' Donuts, you've got trainers, you've got promoters, you've got all kinds of people who are going to help all of these Dunkin' Donuts survive. And then you have the franchise. And then, if you look to the right, you can even go overseas, and there can be regional regions and nations. And then franchises under that. There's also in these, um, some of these companies, there's franchise developers. In other words, there might be a guy that opens up 10 franchises. That's just an authority flow. But within that authority flow, there's people with giftings. A guy who's called to train, who has a gifting to train, he, he doesn't run a franchise. He goes from franchise to franchise to franchise, and he trains. There, there are troubleshooters in the business world. Their job is to go in and figure out where are you losing your money and where are, you, where are your people not doing their job. He comes in and he, he troubleshoots. He says, that's wrong there. That needs to change there and that needs to change there. And then he goes home. He doesn't then call the clerk back the next day at her home phone and talk to her about her job. So he's kind of like the prophet the prophet's a troubleshooter. He comes into your church, and God uses him to put his finger on some things. But the prophet isn't supposed to then call all your saints and counsel them. The prophet's supposed to go home and let you take care of whatever you helped him figure out was wrong with your particular place. Well, who handles the money in something like that? Well, the franchise owner handles the money. Some people will say, well, we're a pastoral organization, and we just limit it to pastors. No, our pastor is the franchise guy. That's why he handles the money. That's why he decides which prophet should come in and minister to him or to his people. It's not that he's in control of everything. It, it just makes sense in our structure. So let me go to the next slide and just show you how right now, this is how the UPC kind of looks. And this might be one way the five-fold ministry could fit into what we already have in place as a model. We have a general conference. We have the general board. We have the officials and all the department heads that help lead our movement as a whole. I know this isn't from the book of Acts, but we have to come up with some kind of structure here on earth. Uh, 
then we have strategic partners. For example, the Pentecostal Publishing Help House helps us all. All of our departments help all of our churches, our schools, conferences like this. The, the, I mean, the UPCI website, they all can help all of our franchises do well. You'll go to the right. Then we have administrators. We have prophets and evangelists and teachers. They're available to all of our vocations. But just because they're ahead of pastor in the list doesn't mean they're over you. It doesn't mean that the prophet is over all the pastors because prophet came before pastors in the list. And then you have franchises, which... Our, our local churches are, uh, that are under districts. And then you have maybe, and this, I'm throwing this out for discussion, if you go just a little bit to the right, you might have some men among us who are church planters who have more than one franchise. We might call them an apostle. They're sent to an area. They're going to start a dozen works. That doesn't mean they're above everybody who's called a pastor. That doesn't mean all teachers bow to them when they meet them somewhere. It doesn't mean that they get paid more money. It just means that's their gifting. We figured out this guy starts church as well. This guy teaches well. This guy administrates well. This guy's a prophet. If you put a prophet as a pastor, he's frustrated. But our structure sometimes is so stringent that we, all we know is pastor, and we're scared of everybody else. I, I heard someone say it this way, and I, I agree that sometimes we get uh, we get afraid that, like, you have the pastor, and he's loving, and he wants to take care of everybody, and, you know, pat him on the head like we saw last night. And, and then you have the prophet comes in. Bless God. God wants to cleanse this church of sin, and blah, 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 blah. And the pastor's over here. Oh, don't hurt my saints. Oh, don't hurt my saints. And the giftings are at odds with one another, right? And then the teacher steps up to the podium, and he says, this is the way it is, and I can, I can prove this 16 different ways, and if you don't believe this, boy, you're going to hell, because I can prove that and that and that and that. And, and the evangelist is saying, here we are in this conference again. We sat here for six days, and nobody's witnessed anybody. We need to be out there winning the lost. Let's go win the lost. And then when they, you, you go out and win the lost and they get saved, you say, don't go to that conference. They're just sitting around for days. Let's go win the lost. And so the, the evangelists want to be over here in their corner with all the evangelists winning the lost. The teachers want to have all their conferences. And all we're doing is teaching one another. The pastors just want to love everybody. The prophets over here seeing visions and dreams. And the apostles overseas getting things done. We need to talk about it. We've heard two fantastic presentations here this morning that are just mind-boggling. And thank you for that. Now, I am, what do you call me in the moderator? Notice you didn't cover moderators. Uh, so, so I want to ask you, who at this moment is the moderator? Thank you. And I was assigned that job by the the bishop who's running this meeting at this moment, right? So don't mess with me. <laughs> Here's what we have to do. We can't have comments on this because it's too, it would, it would we could end up in a riot, actually. <laughs> so as the moderator, do we have another speaker here this morning? And so I do have a duty to get him on the floor here in about 10 minutes, right? So you can ask questions. The ruling has been laid down by the moderator. So I heard, saw your hand. We're going to ask questions and let, try to give him difficult questions because he's opened up a can of worms. So <laughs> it's a great job. Excellent teaching. Uh, I happen to have the privilege of being at General Conference hearing uh, this discussion. Would you elaborate on the difference between post-ascension and pre-ascension apostles? that was mentioned in that meeting? Uh, in my understanding, there's the 12 apostles, the apostles of the Lamb, but there were other people in Scripture that were called apostles. And so it, it just looked like the church carried on with apostles, uh, you know, obviously Paul being one of those, uh, not as just 12. And, and that's just in the book. Of, same, same thing with prophets. The reason we believe in prophets is because they're called prophets in the book of Acts. Not because later on, you know, 
in our century, we said, hey, we believe in prophets. But just looking back at the book of Acts. So if there were no other apostles mentioned but the 12, we, we could maybe say that was just a special group of people. But there were actually uh, several others mentioned by name in Scripture. Uh, two questions. Um, number one, could you like maybe give a uh, just a, a basic definition at this point of what you think an apostle would be and a prophet would be? And then second question, do you think a five-fold ministry of those uh, pastor, teacher, evangelist, prophet could exist all in one local church? Let me deal with the last one first. I do believe it could all happen with one church, and I don't think they even have to be licensed. They don't have to be ministers. There can be prophets who are not licensed ministers, in my opinion. In fact, there's a man in my church that comes to me often. He's kind of like a, a, a guy, in the, a, a scout in the Army. He'll come to me and tell me things, and I'll tell him, well, you've told me. Now, you don't worry about what I do with that, but that's good, that's good intel that you, you're giving me. Uh, so as far as the, the fivefold, the, uh, the definition, like I said, there's eight pages in my book. And uh, I would rather you went to that and, and looked at that because that's scholarly what they say from Scripture, what an apostle is. But, you know, simply it's usually just one sent. And obviously sent by who? Well, there's a, an authority that sends them to do their thing. So let me give you an example. Some churches feel like there are men in their congregation who are there to help them start daughter works or congregations. They're an apostle. They're sent you go get that done. You get that up and going. And in fact, some people will say the reason that Corinthians says, firstly, apostles, secondarily, prophets, thirdly, pastors, is because that's the order in which they come to establish things. Uh, let me put it this way. I wrote a book called My Conductor, where I have to think big picture. And the big picture is God is the conductor, and he's leading this thing. But uh, he's got a violin section over here, he's got a pianist over here, he's got the percussions there, and everybody, they're very different, distinct giftings. But if they don't come in right when he says to come in, you got a mess. And so we got to learn how to orchestrate this thing. And uh, an apostle, if, if they're one sent, or a prophet, if they're just one that God uses to, like a troubleshooter, like I was saying, somebody he uses to speak to someone, well, uh, when it's time for them to go, it's time for them to go. Uh, and as a body, we have to learn how sometimes to sit still as the pianist plays for 10 minutes. Everybody else just sitting there. Nobody's getting any glory except for that pianist. A pianist might actually be someone that we're, we know something about. You know, they're not the greatest person. But, but right now, they're preaching the conference. Right now, they're the ones that God's using in a, in a particular place. And so... I don't know if that strays or if that helps you. Uh, there was a second question. I don't know if I got uh, the middle question. Did I answer that? Okay. I think uh, in your comments there that, you, you know, what you said about uh, people not understanding their own giftings in a way and how they orchestrate, as you just pointed out, it's good that you went through that again because sometimes people come in who recklessly move in the spirit or in their giftings can destroy a church or undermine a pastor who's stuck with yeah. things and that uh, I hope we all caught that because how many of us have had people come into our church and who really truly did have certain abilities and gifts and yet they just created enough problems for you that you said never again yeah. you know because they don't understand how to operate in that can so I, that very important and I share just one thing that just as a pastor the most helpful thing I ever did in my church is uh, uh, you know the scripture tells us let one prophesy and others judge what I've, I've encouraged people to move in the spirit, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, even saints, you know, just move in your gifting. But I've said, if anybody ever comes to you with a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge, you need to then come and get that judged. I mean, literally come up and say, brother, so-and-so said this to me. I want to submit that to you. But what that does, see, I can't, I can't expect brother so-and-so to come to me because he's wanting to give these little words everywhere, whatever. But if you want to be safe, you come get that judged, and me or an elder can judge that, and we can also help sometimes put it in context, because they may say something to you that you take to mean something, and we can help you find a biblical place to plug that in. But that has saved my bacon many times, because it's allowed me to set people free to move in the gifts 
But it's also helped me to realize who's not really moving in the gifts. And then I can go talk to them and say, you know, you've talked to three different people and you're just steering them wrong. We need to talk about this kind of thing. The, uh, thank you. And the, the a, uh, AOG, if you haven't read this book, you might want to write this down. The AOG, Assemblies of God, got, they got a lot of destructive forces that went through their movement, the charismatic movement and so forth. There was a book written, was, we were all reading it about maybe 25 years ago. It's still valid today. I distribute it to students, certain students and advanced students at IBC. It's called God Told Me to Tell You. And it is about these people that go around and say, God told me to tell you. And they can cause chaos in a church. And people are trying to believe that they were prophets or whatever. But I, I want to go back to that again because I think None of this works if we don't keep it under pastoral authority. I believe in pastoral authority because I'm living and dying with that church and I'm bleeding for them. I'm burying them and I'm marrying them. And, uh, you know, I don't like anybody to come in and cause chaos because uh, for sometimes you get the prophet and then sometimes you get the, the, the uh, tornado that wrecks everything. All right. Now, as moderator, and we got another speaker. One more question for Brother Khan. And then, of course... We could talk all day here, all right? So one more question. And they can get your book where? Okay, there you go. Honestly, I've had a hard time putting my head, so to speak, around the whole concept and how it's defined. Let me just make several questions here. Can there be multiple giftings? You look at Paul, he was an apostle, but who did they call to teach Paul? Could there be multiple in that also levels where a man might be gifted to go into places, start works wherever it might be, yet also be in some of the other giftings as a, as a prophet or as an, evan you know, an evangelism or teaching or whatever? Just the illustration that helps me is if I'm an electrician, I may, my dad was an electrician. Once he had a job where he went to houses and he, he pulled the wires. That's what he did. But then he went to a refinery where he worked as a different kind of electrician. Uh, and he had a boss who was an electrician, but he didn't do any electrical work. He managed other electricians. So sometimes even our giftings allow us to manage other people with those giftings. And sometimes I'm, I may have... I may be a cook, so I want to start a restaurant, but at first, I'm the cook and bottle washer, right? And sometimes as a pastor, we kind of have to serve multiple roles. Even if they're not gifting, sometimes we have to, you know, do the work of an evangelist. But I, I really believe that we have scripture that there's multiple gifting, and that's, that's what kind of pushes me toward believing in giftings being rather giftings instead of offices. All right. All uh right. It's got to be a little question. All right, go. You brought your book to give the I don't think he's mentioned giving the book to. He's not that gifted. He's not that gifted. I, I'm not sure if you understood. The, the gift on the five, I mean, the book on the fivefold ministry is a free ebook if you go to the website. There's no such thing. It's only ebook. Here you go. It's all out there somewhere. And then, uh, uh, but you do have some copies of your book, and you can order the book. And Brother Khan, by the way, is a great, great writer, and we've tried to put some of your articles in the Perspective magazine, but thank him for his work. We sometimes forget the labor that's in this kind of work.